So grief is not something that is often discussed in Canadian society and grief education in general is often neglected. Numerous myths exist around grief. So part of our mission here at DWDC is that through advocacy, public education and personal support, um, Dying with Dignity Canada ensures Canadians have access to quality end of life choice and care. It can be argued that quality end of life care transcends into grief education as it's something that affects not only the dying person, but the family and friends as well. Grief literacy is in no way a clinical offering, but instead it is one that focuses on public education. I would now like everyone um, who's watching from home, I invite you all to light a candle if you feel called to do so, or if your space allows it, to honor the people who, uh, to honor the people we are speaking about and anyone in your own lives whose memory is top of mind during today's session. So today's topic is grief and medical assistance in dying. And we're joined by three wonderful guests who are here to discuss the grief experienced following a maid death and common myths and misconceptions about grief in maid. So we have Sylvia Henshaw, who's a retired nurse and member of DWDC's First Person Advocates Initiatives Council. Her husband, Douglas, accessed MAID in 2016. Since that time, Sylvia has frequently spoken and written about their experience. Next, we have Dr. Jyoti Jairaman, who's a palliative care physician, who's been a MAID provider and assessor since 2016. Dr. Jairaman is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Family Practice and an associate member, Department of Medicine, Division of Palliative Care at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC. Finally, we have Jamie Foley, who's a spiritual care practitioner and spiritual care coordinator based in Kitchener, Ontario. He's also a registered psychotherapist. So thank you so much, everyone, and we'll begin. Thanks so much, Sam, for the introductions and to our three speakers joining us this afternoon. And uh, you may have noticed Sylvia also has a, a cat um, who might make some additional appearances this afternoon. So we, we welcome um, the cat as well. So Sam uh, read out your bios and uh, that gave us a great summary of who you are. But before we get started, I'm wondering if there's anything else you'd like to share with us. Um, Jody, maybe if you wanted to tell us a little bit more about your journey as a, a MAID provider, that would be a, a good place to start. So thank you, first of all, for inviting me to be part of this. I was really excited, actually. And when I got the list of questions, I was struck by how thought provoking it was. Uh, I've been mulling over my, you know, the, my journey and a journey as a palliative care physician as well, which is over 20 years long now. So uh, some of this might come out in my answer to the questions you've asked me, but I think what I wanted to say was that I have always hoped for this option. Well, well before 2016, you know, going back maybe 20 years when I really got into palliative care, I, I knew that palliative care is my passion. It's my privilege, but I also knew the limitations and I knew that there were people who would like to have had the choice. I had been asked actually during my palliative care of people, some of them had asked if I could when it was not legal and I never did, did go through, but it was difficult. And so I'm very, very grateful that I was, I now have this option to offer my patients. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And it's great to learn a bit more of your history as a, as a physician and um, your thought process over the many years in palliative care. That's great. And uh, next, maybe Jamie, could you tell us a little bit more about the role of a spiritual care practitioner and what that looks like for you, what types of support you provide and uh, anything else about your, your journey in healthcare that you'd like to share? Sure, I'm, I've been working in uh, spiritual care for about 10 or 11 years. And uh, a lot of the time I feel like I'm working against misconceptions. The way I explain it is everyone, I think, 
that I've ever met is trying to make sense out of where they fit in the world. Most people, most of the time, have some kind of a meaning making system that works for them. It, they feel comfortable with it most of the time. The world sort of makes sense. But people I meet in the hospital, often they're getting a diagnosis or something thrown at them that turns that whole world upside down. The language I often hear is, I can't get my feet underneath me. I feel overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. This doesn't make any sense. So my role is really offering support to people within those kinds of liminal spaces when they're not really sure which way is up anymore. So my job isn't to tell them which way is up, but it's to take the pieces, as it were, that made sense before and to hear from them, okay, what's your world about? What used to make sense? What makes sense now? What's the new information coming in? How do we put this together so that you can feel like you have some kind of sense of control over what's going on in your life? So I take what they offer me and work with that towards hopefully a better sense of meaning, a better sense of security. Uh, often people will use religion as one way of making sense of their world. Uh, in other cases, that's not really the system they use or that may be actively unhelpful. So I'm always working with what we've got. Uh, so whether it's religion or not spirituality, it's always the language that the person uses. Uh, so I'm a registered psychotherapist. That basically means I'm a counselor. I'm trained with, with psychotherapy techniques, but my particular focus is always around helping the person find what's their story, what makes sense to them, how can they move forward. That's me. Thanks, Jamie. That's that's helpful. That gives us a, a good picture of what, what your day-to-day -day looks like and uh, how you're helping people. Thank you. And Sylvia, um, is there anything else you wanted to share with us about you and Douglas? Or um, as mentioned in your bio, you're a retired registered nurse. Um, anything at all that you wanted to share before we get into some of the other questions? Um, I think that I became interested in dying with dignity because of my husband, Douglas. Um, he was the one who found you first when he was ill with Parkinson's disease. And um, after his death in 2016, I became a volunteer with Dying with Dignity and um, as well as speaking and writing about our experience, as you've said, I've also assisted four of my friends and <clears throat> have been able to steer several other people to the Dying with Dignity website and in some cases have printed off information for them and they've carried the ball from there. But I know um, that telling our story, especially in a small town where everyone knows everyone, uh, really made a tremendous difference to the people in this town. And it's, I'm sure if we went by numbers of assisted deaths, of medically assisted deaths per population, we're pretty high and it's all because everyone was so open about it after the fact and that it doesn't just happen in the big cities. It can be for rural Nova Scotia even. Absolutely. Thank you, Sylvia. So we'll get into uh, some additional questions now. And um, the next few that I'm going to ask are more so about um, some of your personal experiences with Grief. So maybe we can start with um, Jyoti. And the question for you is, you know, as a palliative care doctor, as a maid provider, you're of course supporting a lot of people who are approaching end of life or at end of life. Do you experience grief in your work? And is this something that's addressed in the medical community? Hmm. Now that's the question that had me reflecting the most. Do I experience grief? So you know, I listened to the previous session and one thing that struck me was the definition of grief. We traditionally think of it as a reaction to loss. That's what we usually think grief is. But to me, my grief really has been my reaction to suffering. So not so much reaction to loss, personal or otherwise, it is my reaction as a physician to suffering. And my journey to palliative care began because of that, because I felt 
I had to do something to relieve the suffering that I saw. And so my grief has been most acute and hard to bear when I have not been able to relieve the suffering. So with MAID, at least a few people I felt I could, you know, I know that death is not what everybody wants. Nobody really wants to die, but at least they felt that they could control their suffering with this option. And as a palliative care physician, I felt we could. We were making a, a difference and helping to relieve suffering. But uh, the, I, the unknown for me is the meaning of suffering. Why do we suffer? That has not been answered. And to me, that grief, that is the most acute grief that I bear. Um, it's not something that we talk about much in the medical community, you know, we are ten, we are told, not told, but the models we see are people who you move on, you hurt, but you're not supposed to really talk about it. I'm fortunate because I've usually practiced in a team and the team consists of social workers, of nurses, and I think they are more comfortable with sharing their emotions. It's okay to cry. You know, we physicians are not supposed to cry. We don't show that emotion. But I, I felt very comforted because I could turn around to them and ask, did we do all we could? That to me was always the underlying burning question. Did I do my best? Did I, could I have done anything more? And to be reassured was very comforting. So the broad medical community, which includes the entire team, yes, I have felt supported. Uh, but within the physician community itself, I think we palliative care doctors are a bit better. But overall, I think there's a lot that's not really supported. And uh, yeah, long winded answer. But yes, so that's to me, I would say grief as a reaction to loss for me, not so much. It's a reaction to not being able to relieve suffering. That's my grief. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And that seems to tie in with some other observations from those in, in working in the maid space and, and helping people who are often approached in a, here, you know, this must be so sad for you to work um, in, in this space and, and help people, you know, have an assisted death. But a lot of the responses are, you know, the worst situation for me or the situation that causes me the most pain is when somebody is told no because of limitations in the law and they may, you know, continue suffering for some time. So certainly heard that in the the main community and it seems like it might be misunderstood from some who aren't as involved um, in it. So thank you for that. So Sylvia, the next question is for you. And as somebody who's gone through the maid experience with a loved one, with your husband, what was helpful for you as you navigated your grief? Oh gosh, what was helpful? Um, before he died, and much of my grief was before he died, it was anticipatory grief. Um, I think it was just coping. It, it took everything to just cope and get through the days and keep, keep his spirits up. Um, I, that there was a lot that was actually helpful in our case until um, he applied for the MAID process and then there was hope. But because he was so early, um, Nova Scotia was just a little later getting started than some of the provinces. There was a long wait and there was a lot of anxiety involved in that wait and The thing that changed it all was receiving approval and knowing that in five days he would not have to wake up. And that changed everything so that the final five days there was more joy and more laughter and more relief than there had been in the previous 10 years. Um, that sounds rather stark, but I think it was just one of those situations where we both knew he was going to die. And it was just a question of when and how much more did he have to talk 
tolerate before he died. And um, I agreed with Jaya, the, um, the, the grief is watching the suffering as much as the loss, especially when the suffering goes on for a long time. Yeah. Sylvia, thanks for sharing that experience with us. Um, the next question is for um, both Jamie and Jyothi. Maybe Jamie, you can get us started with your answer. Um, so similar question to, to what I asked Sylvia, but um, what feedback have you heard from, from families who have gone through um, the main death of a, a family member or friend about what's been helpful or unhelpful for them as they navigated their, their grief? Each, each family is different, so it's a little hard to say. One universal that I've heard from a number of different spouses is the feeling that they have to put their own feelings on the shelf while they're supporting the person who's requesting and waiting for maid. Uh, in one case, I remember in particular, it was a long process because the person made the application and then they decided to postpone the date for the provision of made by a week uh, to help some other family members who were trying to get in touch and come to terms. It was the right decision for the patient, but it was extra stress for the spouse. And she, I was going just about every two or three days to check on them. They stayed in the hospital. Uh, after made had been provided was when the spouse showed the feelings that I had been told all along by other family members were there. Up until that point, she was kind of holding it together. And it was like, okay, it's finally done. I can relax, but oh my goodness, there's a lot there to, to now start to, to work my way through. I, I've heard that from a number of, of different family members, the feedback that they, they don't feel like they can really be honest about their own feelings because they're trying to be strong for the person who's the identified patient, as it were, the one who's supposed to be getting all the help. And I'm not sure what we might have been able to do differently in that case, except to identify that this is probably going to happen and to remind the person that it will probably hit you pretty hard. But even then, that's really hard to know until it happens. Uh, there's other cases often where I find there's so much emotion leading up to the actual procedure and so many administrative hurdles that by the time it actually happens, families are exhausted. And they're often like, okay, we're done. All right, thanks, bye. And I'm like, we're here to support, but they're heading out the door and they don't want to see the hospital anymore. So, uh, I'm thinking that it would be nice if we could build more follow-up for families, have something normalized and built in that's there from the outset, uh, that we inform families that this is going to be a phone call that's going to happen two, three days or a week down the road. It's not because of anything in particular, except we found that it's helpful for, for everybody to have that option. Um, the other thing would be to have some administrative hurdles lowered quite a bit. Uh, Bill C7 helps a lot for that uh, and watching with interest how that's going to play out. But that's caused a lot of suffering and angst. And I've heard that from plenty of families and staff and just about everybody when we're holding everything up to dig for one extra witness or holding everything up because the hospital won't let us sign the forms or all sorts of other stuff like that. We didn't dot our I or cross our T and all of a sudden we're back to square one. So if anything we can do to make that smoother because I, I understand the safeguards, but they end up causing grief in other ways. Absolutely, thank you, Jamie. Uh, Jyothi, anything to to add anything that you've observed on your end? Yeah, um, I think there are a couple of things. One is, as Jamie said, the lack of follow-up support. To me, that has been quite stark in some cases. I've been asked, 
And we've seen where we had a pilot project in Vancouver where they actually had this. And I was so excited, but I don't think they had the funds to keep it going. And I had two patients, uh, spouses, who not necessarily spouses, uh, one mother and uh, a spouse, who both had had complicated grief and I was still in touch with them. And they explained that it was very helpful to be amongst others who had experienced a made death. Which brings me to the point of this specific way of dying, dying by maid. Today in Canada, it is still not something you would see in an obituary. You know, you might, I might see my name mentioned, thank you to Dr. Jairaman. And so I know that that's their way of saying it, but they don't say my, my what if whoever um, had a maid death. That's very rare. I think it's happening a little bit more, but not often. So there's a secrecy that the family tends to maintain, especially amongst the broader community. And I actually had one patient spouse tell me that finally what, what she did was she, she was in a park and she was sitting on a bench, very lonely. Uh, an older woman, she and her husband were the only two who, who you know, they, they, they were distant from everyone else. And so there she was sitting on the park and a stranger sat down next to her and they started talking. And she found herself telling him. And it was, she came and said, it was so cathartic. He was a complete stranger, but I couldn't, I could tell the truth. I could say what happened. So... I think we need that. I'm hoping that as Canada becomes more open with that, people will feel comfortable saying, yes, my loved one chose a maid death. And I think that will relieve some of the suffering. And I think the second thing would be to have a lot more support in place. Um, I myself do something which I sort of think about a lot. I mean, before the maid death, I'm very available. But uh, I'm also available after for those who want to reach out. But during the provision, this is something which within the, our maid community, we discuss a bit because we wonder about the, the family is as close as possible to the dying person. Now, I feel that as a provider, I, it's a great privilege for me, but I also ask that I be included for that short time within the family. I, I, I immerse myself so that I can share and I grieve with you. And it's very important to me. And I hope that it's important to the family as well, because um, I don't want to be a distant person, you know, just doing this. I am with you. And I'm hoping that perhaps grief shared can maybe be grief a little lessened. Thank you. That was so well put, and um, we appreciate you sharing that with, with us today. So I have a question for Sylvia. And uh, Sylvia, you, um, as mentioned, you're a retired RN. So did your nursing experience influence how you experienced the death of your, your husband and the grief that followed? Is there any takeaways that you had from your career as a nurse that helped you through that or was it, um, did you have any comments on, on that? Um, I'm sure it did as any um, old nurse, any nurse will tell you that probably the most formative years were your years of training and, and especially my early career. But I have to say that nothing in my training training or in my career prepared me for assisting my husband in his quest for an assisted death. Um, I felt like I was being torn into. I felt like I was, I'm, well, I was his physical and emotional support. It was exhausting. And at the end of the day, or at least at the end of my rope, I still had to do be his legs, be his fingers on the keyboard, be his voice to do all that was necessary to, to make the arrangements. And in 2016, there were a lot for the family to do. Um, so I think it helped me handle his death, which I, although I, I wasn't comfortable leading up to it, at the time of death, I sat and held his hand just 
like any other wife would. I was just very relieved to be able to sit back and be a wife and not, not be a caregiver. And afterward, um, I still had some guilt, some what if, um, some, oh my God, what have I done? Um, but in the end, I kept coming back to, he was a very clever man. He knew what he wanted. He knew how he wanted to go once he learned that it might be an option. And I did a lot of reminding myself of that, that he left the way he wanted. He had to leave a bit later than he would have chosen, but he, uh, he died his way in the end. Sylvia, we appreciate you being so open about your experience, and I'm sure it's it's not easy to relive some of you know what what you and Douglas went through together. So you, Sylvia, you actually touched on this um, earlier when you were answering a question, but uh, this question is actually for Jamie. Um, we hear the term anticipatory grief used quite often, and I'm wondering if you could tell the audience more about what, what that is, what that means, and when we might uh, see or experience anticipatory grief. Uh, I think traditionally it's thought of as the, the feeling of distress that people feel before an anticipated uh, death or an anticipated loss of some sort. Um, and sometimes people will feel it more than others and the sense is with me that you're planning ahead more so that it can become more acute. I tend to have a bit of a different take on anticipatory grief. For me, it's a way of describing how people feel when they're dealing with uncertainty, honestly. And that may sound a bit odd because, well, nothing seems more certain than having a made date. So this Friday at nine o'clock in the morning, the doctor is going to come. Uh, but in reality, people only go through death once and they nobody really knows what it's going to be like when they actually get there. So I find anticipatory grief is usually a way of describing this attempt to control the future, to try to plan for the unplannable, trying to control what's happening, trying to cushion the blow. It's, it's necessary. I think it's completely normal. Uh, it can actually, like research has shown, it doesn't actually necessarily make the subsequent grief or loss that much easier to deal with. It probably changes it. Uh, I'd suggest ways to address it, but it's it's good work. I think the more control we can give to families and spouses in particular, the easier that natural process will be when we're throwing all sorts of stuff at them that they can't expect or control, then that sense of, I'm not sure what to expect becomes more acute and there's just more distress to deal with. Thanks, Jamie. And Sylvia, you, you, you mentioned this uh, before that you did have an element of um, anticipatory grief with the death of your husband. Can you share a little bit more um, about that experience and what that looked like for you and what some of those um, emotions were? Um, I think in the beginning, my grief was for what I had lost. I know this sounds very selfish, but that was what was foremost in my mind, that I'd lost my partner, my support, uh, and he became my patient. That was very hard. And then I started seeing the losses through, through the eyes of my husband, and that was a whole lot harder. Um, Again, I go back to the, the suffering and the waiting for death is harder than the death itself at a certain stage. And I just um, remember how frustrating it was not to be able to do anything to alleviate his pain or his suffering, his mental anguish and the realization that I was going to lose my partner of 44 years 
in a matter of weeks. It was worse than the event itself, I think. Sylvia. And uh, the next couple questions are, again, related to something that you, you touched on, um, grief and how that's experienced by the person who is dying. Um, as many of us know, grief isn't just experienced by the people who are mourning the loss or the death of somebody, but also by the, the person who's um, going to die, whether it's um, a made death or, or not. Um, so this question is for uh, Jothi and Jamie. Um, what types of support do you think are necessary or helpful for those who are going to die with, with MAID um, to help them in those weeks or days leading up to their procedure and, and to help them through that grief that they, they might be experiencing? Um, Jyoti, did you wanna get started? So as Sylvia said, uh, I think most of us go through life not aware of, or perhaps not consciously acknowledging that we are going to die. So th that first uh, brush with not that you are going to die, I think it all starts there, that the, the, the grieving, the, the fear of what's coming, so it starts there. But the, the person who is actually dying, I think begins the most incredible journey, which has been my privilege to share with those who have been able to share with me and how their thought processes evolve. But it's also been through assessing for me that I've understood some of the fears that the dying have. And amongst them, there is a real fear of the loss of physical independence. It's, it's quite significant that a lot of the made requests have come from I want to be able to go to the bathroom. I will not wear diapers. I will not, you know, have a bedpan. It's a strong sense. And I always take it back to when we are infants and potty training is such a big deal and we get our star. And now it's like the reverse. You know, we're being told it's okay. You can wet yourself and people don't like it. So one of the things I've seen because I work in hospice as well is that even patients who've had this strong sense of, I do not wish to be dependent on others, if there are other things that's making their life worth living and they're not in pain or other distress, the physical weakness, if they're in a place like a hospice where they're treated with great respect and love, and we are lucky in Vancouver that we have hospices which permit MAID. So I've had patients who are eligible for MAID move into hospice mm -hmm. and have deferred their uh, date or I've actually had them pass away in ways which puzzles their relatives because these are people who said they wouldn't ever accept it, but in this loving surrounding. So to me, all dying patients and made patients in particular need to have that choice. They should be allowed to experience if they choose, but um, I, I think it's sadly lacking. We need more of these facilities which will permit made in hospice and also had more hospices and palliative care available. So that's one thing, uh, trying to relieve some of the angst around physical dependence is one thing I think which would be helpful so that they can decide whether if that was taken care of, do they still want to die today or do they want to wait till tomorrow? So that's one thing. The other thing I find is that uh, in these days of texting, what's happened is I find with the, with the physical fatigue and I think the mental fatigue, short texts between my patient and me have been almost poetic. And we've carried on conversations, not all, but a few which I've actually preserved because they are so beautiful. And some of the questions, some of the texts are around, you know, I need my spouse to understand. What can I do? Because that's causing them a lot of, they, they're, they're supportive, but I know they're not really they haven't come to grips. Can you help me with that? So the dying patient wants, you know, a, a made death, a planned made death. They would like to know that they are not leaving behind someone who's questioning their decision. Another thing that a made patient has said to me is, you know, do you think I'm a coward? Do you think, is this, am I just taking the easy way out? And, and so reassurance with that is helpful. Um, in the end, though, I would say actually knowing their date of death they struggle. Yeah, that's another point I wanted to make. I've been surprised by how difficult some have found to set a date. They keep wondering, will I know? 
when the time is right, how will I know? And, and that causes a lot of uh, grief as well. Uh, you know, how, how do I set the date? Actually setting the date is in almost all cases wonderfully relieving. They're thankful. I know this is going to happen. Everyone can pull together. And so I would say it's leading up to MAID and, and for any dying person that you find uh, they need support. In, in my case, I, I do engage quite a bit with my patients, with many. Some it's all quick and some don't need me at all, but quite a few I do. It's a privilege. I learn a lot. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that it's there for everybody because some, sometimes maybe there's no time, but I think that's the sort of service that would be helpful. Thank you. And that's great to hear that there's so much um, communication um, between you and, and your patients and that you, you seem to be so available and, you know, texting, phone call, whatever makes the most sense for the, the person. So um, I'm sure that's a great support uh, for folks as well as their, their families. Um, Jamie, did you have any, uh, anything you'd like to share about, um, about the, the grief that the, a dying person might be experiencing? Yeah, I find that people die the way they've lived. And what I mean by that is that I've worked with these guys who've been in the trades their whole life, just kind of not dealing with emotions and feelings very much. And sometimes they get to near the end of life and everyone around them starts looking at them expectantly like they're going to suddenly come out with this deep wisdom of this is what my de death means and I bequeath unto you my family this legacy and it, it doesn't happen and everybody kind of looks around like there's a missing piece. So sometimes my work is just normalizing with some patients. Well, yeah, that's their need. And are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, I'm sick. I don't want to be sick anymore. They can't fix me. I'm ready to go. So, okay. <laughs> One guy I remember very clearly, he said, well, I'll hang on for my sister because she just phoned me and she says, I, I need more time. So, okay, sure, sis, whatever you need. But me, I'm ready to go. So it's a bit more work hanging on for her. <laughs> so I, for other patients, other people, it's it's very much more involved and they are trying to work a lot out in the process. And a lot of it then is claiming their space. Perhaps that's a universal. People who are requesting a made death are usually claiming something in terms of control about their own lives. I've had hospital staff look at me like that's a bad thing. But I say to them, how much control have we taken away from this person already? How much has their disease taken away from them? They're not control freaks. They've already lost the ability to walk. They've lost the ability to go to the bathroom independently. They've lost the ability to think clearly sometimes. Uh, they've lost so many things that we all take for granted. And yes, some of that is the process. And some of that is we can support people around and hospice does a wonderful job of that. Uh, and some of it, we can also give back to them by saying, yes, we recognize your request. Yes, we will support you. And here is what we can do to support you and your request to take control of, of what's happening to you. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, Sylvia, is there anything else that you wanted to share about uh, Douglas's experience with grief leading up to his MAID procedure? Um, I certainly agree with Jamie and um, Jayathi about the, the losses that they've experienced. And I, I would like to add that um, the palliative care doctor who was to perform Doug's procedure became a very good friend to him in the five days that he had. At that time, the date was set for us. There, there weren't enough practitioners to choose a date. So the date was set by the doctor and he phoned every day over the long weekend to talk. And, uh, and I really loved Jamie's talk about the control because my husband had been a surgeon. He was used to being in control. When the uh, nurse came to start the IV prior to the procedure, he pointed out his best veins. He debated the bore of the needle with her to make sure she had a big enough one. And uh, when 
she got the IV up and running. He was counting the drops, wondering if it wasn't fast enough to keep his veins open. He truly took control at the end after having had no control for probably at least five years. And it was very empowering for him. And um, I think it was uh, Jayathi who mentioned how difficult it is to set the date. And I do have a friend who had that problem. She uh, kept asking me, how do I know when to set the date? How do I know when to let go? Am I giving up? And I, she was breathless. I could hardly hear her. her this was on, this was at a distance. Um, her husband was sitting with his head down, falling asleep, totally exhausted. And I gently reminded her of why she chose Maid in the beginning, which was not to put her family through the suffering that she had watched her mother go through. And uh, once she chose her date, which was a very short time away, she was enlightened. And she, she again, could just relax and her job was done. So it's, it's really good to hear that uh, uh, from the personal experience and from the professional experience, we're all seeing the same thing. Thank you, Sylvia, um, for sharing about Douglas and um, other friends that, that you know who have uh, chosen MAID. I think what's interesting about Douglas's experience is he um, was a, a doctor until the end. He took that experience yeah. and he, you know, gave his feedback and, and wasn't, you know, shy about making sure that his, <laughs> um, his thoughts were known in that moment. And I think that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, what we also see with MAID deaths is, um, not everybody has that same medical background, but they do often know themselves and what they want more from a ceremonial uh, yeah. level. So I want yeah. this music, I want this food, I want this person yes. there or not there. So um, absolutely, there can be a lot of um, control over those final moments um, for the person. That's great. Yes. So uh, a general question, and this one's for, for everybody, um, but from your perspectives, what are some common myths or misconceptions about MAID and grief? And some of this may have been covered already in some of your answers, but if there's anything you can think of that we maybe haven't gone over that you'd like to share, that would be great. Anybody have anything and want to, to go first? Well, okay, I'll go first. Great. <laughs> so. One of the things actually ties in what, with what Sylvia just mentioned about uh, trying to figure out how to set the date. Because I think uh, amongst those of us who have fiercely advocated and support the right to die, even I, who's been so intimately involved with death and dying for such a long time, I've been surprised by the uh, anguish that many people experience with the choice that they now have a choice has actually, so I think the myth in my mind, the misconception I had was that it was uniformly a wonderful thing. You know, for those who support and want me, this was just an amazing thing. And ultimately, of course, it still is, but there is a significant amount of distress, which I didn't anticipate in just the, having a choice. Now that I've, even amongst those who filled out the request form, they've been told they're eligible, they then, especially those who say something like ALS, where very quickly they make the request because they're so scared that maybe they won't be able to articulate what they want and all that. So they do it. And then somehow they're able to carry on for quite a while. And, and they just, the, the having the choice is causing them a lot more distress than I thought they would. So that's my, my observation. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, who who wants to go next? Uh, I'll jump in and say, I find in a lot of ways, grief is grief. And one of the misconceptions I encounter is the sense that this is somehow an alien experience if it involves made, that, that this grief must be totally different from anything anyone's ever encountered before and that we need to have absolutely completely different ways of working through it. Yes and no. I know we've just spent about 50 minutes talking about ways that it is different. 
But on the face of it, loss and suffering and how we respond to those is, is pretty, it's a universal human experience. And I don't know that we need to trace too many lines of distinction around them. But, and I find that can get in our way, particularly part of my work is supporting hospital staff. And that's where I get a lot of the misconceptions. It's this feeling that, oh my goodness, somebody just asked for me, this is completely new. What do we do? We're scurrying around and saying, call the psychiatrist, call this, call this. And I'm like, whoa, slow down. It's okay. <laughs> so that's, that's my two cents. Thanks, Jamie. Sylvia? Um, I think my, the one that irritates me the most is that it's an easy way out and it's uh, suicide. And I heard that a lot in 2016, 2017. I don't hear that anymore. Um, I don't think that people were aware of the safeguards that were in place. And actually in our case, because Doug was only the third death in the province, it was more like begging. Um, and he had a neurological disease rather than cancer or something that was going to bring a definite end date. Um, that was, that's one of the misconceptions that really upset me. And the other one is that somehow people who are vulnerable or handicapped are now in danger of uh, being forced or encouraged to accept MAID. And again, um, it's been a year since the last death that I was involved in, but there was it, it was more of a, a struggle to get all the approvals and, and get everything ready than it was. Well, of course, you know, there's always, this is an option. I think in all cases, uh, if my friends hadn't known about it, I'm not sure they would have been told about it. Certainly not in our palliative care over the last, um, well, up until a year ago, our palliative care was not recommending people for MAID. Um, some of the doctors were performing the procedure. It wasn't, it wasn't palliative care overall. It was just uh, the choice of, of many of them. So the easy way out and that nobody is safe anymore. Those are the two misconceptions that I try to sort out if I hear them. I, I would add to that, Sylvia, that I still unfortunately hear a lot of people drawing the parallel with suicide which to me is intensely offensive. I have a close friend who died by suicide. It's a completely different experience than supporting somebody through MAID. Mm -hmm. uh, that in one case, it was unexpected, hidden. There was no conversation about what was mm -hmm. going to happen. Mm -hmm. MAID, there's tons of conversations mandated and other ones that happen as a matter of course. And it's above board it, everyone knows what's going on and if they have a right to input, they get their input. So it's it's really bizarre to me that people draw these parallels too, but unfortunately it still happens. And I think adding to Sylvia's um, comment on palliative care, unfortunately it is still the case that um, even our national organization of um, the physicians, palliative care physicians, we are still not supportive of MAID. And so uh, even here in BC, it's not, although there are some uh, palliative care physicians who may do it, it's not considered part of it. It's not considered part of our toolbox. And one reason that I've had my colleagues, close colleagues really tell me is because palliative care physicians feel, you know, as physicians, we are born to succeed. And for them, it's a sense of failure. I could not provide this patient a good death and that's why they're choosing me. It sort of becomes about them. I couldn't provide a good death and therefore they are just, so I feel a failure. And I think that's something they have to get past. It's, it's sort of, uh, yeah. And there's one thing I forgot to mention about the patients who are dying and who, what support they need when they, are, they have made. One of the hardest things has been when the, I've had to provide in secrecy because the, the entire family is opposed. So it has just been me and the nurse with the patient. And it's so, I, I've, it's been so sad, but in the end that person is still 
comfortable, they're happy, they're doing what they're doing. I have no idea what kind of complicated grief the family must experience. But that to me is why I feel like we, we just have to have more education and openness around it. Thank you for that. Um, so a couple more questions before we open it up to audience questions. So just a reminder for audience members, if you do have anything you'd like to ask, just type that into the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. Um, so we are hosting a session uh, later on in our series about children and grief. So we will have a whole uh, over an hour dedicated to just that topic. Um, but I'd love to hear from the three of you, uh, any thoughts you have about um, children's experience with grief, uh, children's experience with grief following a, a maid death, um, whether or not you think children should be present for a maid death and if that helps them with their grief or is harmful, just any comments that you have about that would be, uh, would be appreciated. Anyone like to, would like to start? Maybe Jamie, if I put you on the spot. <laughs> no. Well, the easiest thing I can say with children is let them be your guide. Um, it's going to be very age dependent what, what kind of information a kid is going to want. Um, and there's some good resources out there in terms of breaking it down by age and saying from like sort of kindergarten to grade one, this, and then for, middle age or middle school kids this uh, but generally the other part is that kids will tend to take their cues from the adults around them so if the adults are communicating that there's a big problem then it's going to be more distressing for the kids if the adults are indicating this is normal and okay then the kids are going to follow the lead that way as well in terms of the language to use it's it's fairly simple that grandpa was so sick that we couldn't couldn't make him better. Uh, so he really needed to rest. It can be as simple as that. For some kids, that's all they're going to need. And then they'll come back with more questions as what's going on here? What's why uh, is grandpa coming back next week? Uh, will we see grandpa again? Give them the, the information they need, but don't belabor it because then it's making it more about the adults' needs. If we go into more detail, then it's usually burdening the kids with the adults' grief and the adults' processing. As far as having kids there during the May procedure, again, situation dependent. It's going to depend on, uh, I think, the quality of the relationship that they have. Is this a grandparent that they spent a lot of time with? Is this a, their own parent that's dying? Is this some remote person they don't really know? And this is going to be more frightening. So that's that's hard to say in advance. I haven't had a lot of direct experience with kids. And I think some of that has been because the families have already said, oh, well, so-and-so, we're not going to bring them in because that'd be too hard. In one case, which was really nice, we had uh, several generations of family present at the same time. Most important thing we could do as a hospital was to give them lots of space, uh, literally and figuratively, to make as simple as just getting them a big enough room to fit 30 people in the room at once. And it was quite beautiful to have everyone there because there was a mutual support network. Everybody was talking back and forth. And it was a sacred moment, too. It wasn't just chatting around the, the Christmas tree, but there was there was more going on and there was space for everybody to to meet. Jamie, yeah, one other uh, piece of advice I've heard from a maid provider is, um, you know, if a child is going to be at a maid uh, procedure and there is a lot of um, other family members or friends there to have that child have a go-to person. So if things do get too intense for them and they need to go, they're not you know, maybe pulling on their mother, who's the daughter of the person dying, and they kind of have their other person who's a little bit more removed, a friend or, you know, somebody like that, who they can um, go to and be uh, taken to another space if needed. I was going to say just that, <laughs> that I, I think I've had, a, a, the youngest I've had is a 12-year-old, and I was a little bit uncomfortable, but the 
the father of the child was very sure that he's going to be okay. And so, uh, as you said, you need to have someone there who will be keeping an eye, not so much on what's going on to the patient as much as on that child. And I agree with Jamie that to me, the decision comes down to, especially say most deaths are, have taken, there's been a journey and how much has that child accompanied the dying person on that journey? So they don't come parachuting in just for the death. It's not like a funeral, for example, where all sorts of people will gather from everywhere. This is not that. This is different. And so if that child has been part of the illness and part has seen everything, I think that I would say, yeah, that it's more comfortable. I've had patients who've said, I don't want my grandchildren to see me like this. So they've even avoided contact during the entire dying process because they've deteriorated. So um, as Jamie says, I think it depends. It's very individual. But your point, Kelsey, about making sure that someone is there to uh, to anticipate any un you know and and adults do it too. There are adults who just collapse and it's distracting. It's uh, unnerving for the others. So it's always good to have someone who can say, okay, you know, sometimes it's our nurse who take the person away. But yeah. Uh, Sylvia, anything to add? Um, I agree that it's going to be family uh, dependent. It just it, and it depends on how they handle the death themselves. Um, in my case, my local grandchildren were seventeen and twenty. They were told a few days in advance about their grandfather's impending death, and they uh, chose not to be in the facility when it happened. Uh, we certainly talked about it afterwards, but I contacted them last week to see if they would share what they were feeling then and compare it to how they feel now about their grandfather's choice. And they both said the same thing, that um, they admired him for his choice. They knew it was what he wanted. They knew how much he was suffering. And uh, they were still very proud of him. And they both ended by saying that if they found themselves in the same situation, it's what they would want as well. Thank you, Sylvia. And that's great that um, you continue to have those conversations with your, yes. your grandkids as well, and that it's not something that is in the past and we forget about it, but you're continuing no. to honor your husband's memory and the choice he made and keeping your family uh, involved with, with those discussions and, and that reflection. That's great. Yes. All right, so I think we will open it up uh, to some of the questions that came through uh, ahead of time um, through the registration as well as some that are coming through now. So I will welcome Nicole uh, Curtis, my colleague. There she is. Hi. And she will uh, be managing the Q&A. Great. All right, so we've had a lot of questions coming in. So thank you to everyone who has submitted their questions and just a reminder, um, I'm going to try and get to as many of these as possible, but if uh, we don't get to your question, please email us support at dyingwithdignity.ca and we will follow up with you directly. Um, okay, let's get started. So, I mean, we talked about uh, anticipatory grief, grief after grieving after the May death, and there's this question um, that we got around dealing with stigma after losing a loved one who chose maid and does that play into the grief so um, maybe Sylvia I'll, I'll ask you to answer that one first it certainly did in my case um, because it was so new um, and because my husband was who he was he was very secretive about his application for maid um, no one really knew except the um, site manager of the nursing home he was in for his last year and his doctor and myself. And so when I came home that night and I started thinking about how would I face my neighbors if they knew, because not, not one of, I, I had talked about it generally with nurse friends as we tend to do, and we're very open with each other, but never had I said that he was going to be dying with maid. Um, there was a lot of, of um, 
of guilt and maybe a bit of fear of rejection by my community, which really was needless because I saw nothing but uh, praise and I received so many thanks for making it open. And I had so many people ask me for material themselves. So the feeling was there. But I and I think when I talk to my friends who've lost loved ones in the, the last uh, couple of years, they don't seem to have that same regret. So I, I think we're, it, it is being talked about much more now. Right. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Josie or Jamie, do you have anything to add about the stigma and how that plays into the grief? I, um, especially here in Vancouver, I have provided to patients who are immigrants from other countries. And culturally, there is a huge difference. And it's, it's shocking for many people. And so I've had patients who had to be so secretive because they can't uh, you know, in a particular case, this, the surviving spouse is planning to return to their country of origin because for supports. And so everything is hushed. And yes, I would agree that, and that's going to be tough. You know, we, it's not easy to explain to, I myself am from India and I'm very open that this is the work I do. I feel like I have to say so, but uh, it's not something that uh, is easily explained and uh, definitely, Yes, it, it, I think it does add to the grief that you, you were already scared that someone will come to know. And so I, I think it's especially true because we are a nation of immigrants and our country is Canada is different from some of the other countries. Mm -hmm. Jamie, anything to add on that one? Uh, I found something similar. It, uh, I think because of my role in spiritual care, I can remember one family where I was supportive of the person making the request and their uh, immediate family members. And that was one conversation. And then I went, when the, the day of the provision, somehow other family members had gotten wind of this and had come to the hospital and had been stopped from going into the room. But we had given them a separate room to meet and I came to check on them. And they were like, oh, good, the chaplain's come. Pray with us. Pray that this will stop. And it was like, OK, how do I? It was, it was a little bit strange, too. So I, I said a prayer with them. But I was, it, was, it took all my balancing skills to try to recognize where they were coming from, where I was coming from, where the person in the back room was coming from, and try to make some kind of a bridge between them. Uh, I don't know how much I succeeded. The family looked a little bit, the extended family looked a little disappointed with me at the end that I hadn't come in with fire and brimstone to call down the, the forces upon this, this horrible thing that was happening. But it, I can also think of another family where they were actively fighting it the whole way and they actually, quote unquote, lost the application form after it had been filled out. And this happened in the community. I heard about it after the fact, but it, it certainly is an issue with some families more than others. Uh, it's a problem. And we need to have more dialogue about this. We need to bring this out in the open because yeah, it is, it's a serious issue. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. What a complex predicament you found yourself in with that one family. Um, okay, let's, uh, another question, uh, we got this question a lot and in different, phrased in different ways, so, um, and maybe Jamie, I'll start with you this time. Is there a specific approach or training to bereavement groups or just helping families uh, who are grieving the loss of a loved one who had made as opposed to a natural death? Um, I don't want to say tips but any approach or best practice? I know we touched on it a bit, but people want to know more. Sure. Uh, I'd say there's nothing standardized as of yet. Uh, so two things. There's uh, good research going on right now. I heard last week about a, a research project out of McMaster University. There's another one out of Nova Scotia and the sort of the, the provincial health region. 
and I believe there's one in Quebec all ongoing at the moment. The results aren't out. One of them was looking at groups, other was looking at family experience more generally. Uh, and I'd say there's a lot of accumulated experience. There's a, a organization which runs online groups, uh, Bridge C14, that's been running for a number of years. And they may have standardized procedures, but the other part of it is that I don't think grief is that foreign experience for us. There's details of it, there's aspects of it that will be different in this case, but I don't know that it's so strange or different that standard training in, in psychotherapy and social work wouldn't be sufficient to, to give you a space to start from. I think the most important thing with grief groups is really creating a space where peers can start supporting each other where you can make a community of trusted people who are going to back each other up. So a lot that a good grief counselor will be doing with the group is laying the groundwork, making the space, and then getting out of the way so that families and people who've experienced made in different ways can connect with each other. So. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Sylvia or, or uh, Josie, did you have anything to add to that? I could just move on to the next question, if not. Well, one small thing I'd add is that I've had a few who wanted to reach out to me and have a really in-depth conversation because their memories, sometimes so much happens during the, the lead up that you mm -hmm. don't quite recall. And so they need me to corroborate. Are you sure that this person chose because they wanted it? Could it be because I wasn't supportive enough? And, and so that guilt is very strong sometimes. And so it's helpful for someone who's walked with them to say, no, this, is, this was their choice. You did everything. They need that reassurance. So I think it's good if those of us who journeyed with the, with the dying person, uh, is we're available to help. Uh, so I've had referrals back to me from the, the pilot support group that we had. I had two patients. Uh, families who were actually, con uh, they contacted me again after meeting with the support group to just get some clarity around that. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to mention um, that uh, the resource that uh, Jamie had mentioned, we will send in the email um, follow up to everyone who attended um, or registered for today's event. Um, Sylvia, I'm going to ask you a question that came in for you, but of course, uh, our other panelists are welcome to answer. Um, you had talked about the anticipatory grief and you had mentioned that, um, you know, once Douglas knew he was going to be able to move forward with MAID, there was that sense of relief. Um, some folks are wondering, um, you know, as they wait for the provision, that time when they're waiting, um, some are wondering if that knowing the time of death would, would cause cause more grief or, or agony. Um, I know you mentioned that wasn't really the case for you, but did you, were you worried about that or did it come up for any of your family members at all? Do you know? Uh, no, it didn't. It was a, a wonderful time. Um, we just talked about family. Once, uh, just let me backtrack here. Once he knew he was going to die, it was never mentioned again. We just talked about our travels, we talked about our family, we talked about our children and our grandchildren. And it, it was never mentioned um, how I would carry on when he was gone because Doug felt I could handle anything. He felt I'd proven that over the, the years. And, uh, and I just knew I didn't have a choice, so there's no point in in bringing it up, but I just remember it. It was over Labor Day weekend that we waited. It was a beautiful weekend. We spent time outside. He slept. He ate more than he had <laughs> for so long. Um, he chose his last meal, which I took in from home, all finger foods, because we're pretty much at that stage, and he could handle it himself. And it was in the strangest way, it was the most relaxing period that you could imagine, and certainly the most relaxing period we had had for such a long time. 
That sounds so nice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Josie or Jamie, do you have anything to add to suggest to families uh, who are worried about the wait time and that grief that they carry between setting the date uh, for their maid procedure and then when the, when the provision is set to take place? I would say that um, while I'm so happy that for you, Sylvia, it unfolded like that, uh, I think almost universally, I would say that for the patient who's dying, it is like that. It is a relief they, they you know, they're just ready and, and it's a, such a burden off their shoulders. But I've encountered, I, I would say that for it's not universally so for the family members. I, I know that there's a lot of worrying and grieving and sometimes an hour before I get a phone call from one of the daughters saying, do you really think this should happen? And I'm like, really now? I mean, I've got my kit. I'm coming. Don't, don't raise this now. And so there is a lot of anguish. I, I cannot, in my experience, and now I've been doing this a lot, I can't say that it's always blessed. It's not. I mean, sometimes it is. And sometimes I've attended gorgeously choreographed you know, where everyone's got into the spirit of it and there's wine and there's flowers and music, but there's also times when, yeah. I, I guess like Jamie said, it's it's how they are, how, how they've been. And does this change everything so much? Probably not. This is how they've approached many things. And I, it's difficult for them to change that behavior. So it's not universally so, but the dying person, I would say almost, 100% of the, in fact, I would say 100%. They are so relieved and they are so thankful. They can't wait for the day, they're happy to go, but not always the relatives. I, I'd agree with Jyoti on that, that uh, yeah, there's some families for which it's this long drawn out affair. There's some families for which it's like, this is my last chance to fix everything and make everything right. But it's not generally the, the person themselves who's made the made request who's driving that. It's the families themselves and the individual members who are scurrying about saying, this is a big deal. We have to fix everything that's been wrong for the last 30 years. And of course, there's never going to be time for that. Uh, but I see that with a lot of anticipated deaths. I don't think that's distinct to made uh, per se. The only thing that's different is there's a specific day set and that can make people more anxious if they're not directly connected with, with the process sometimes is when they're more anxious because they're, they're watching it. We don't really have language in Canada to describe how to, to plan for, for a death like this. We, we don't, other cultures in the past have had that, but I don't think right now we, we have the, the language to, to start thinking about that. So that, that makes it more complicated. Right, right. All right, well, I'm just keeping an eye on the time and we're about a minute over. So I just wanna remind everyone um, watching to submit any uh, last minute questions that you had that didn't get answered um, to our support email. And we wanna thank Sylvia, Josie and Jamie for joining us today. Um, all of your stories and insight is so valuable. So thank you so much for coming. Um, our next session will take place next Wednesday, May 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And the topic will be approaches to death and dying, grief and healing in First Nations communities. So please be sure to register um, and I will put the link in the chat. Um, and just once again, thank you all for coming and thank you to our speakers again. And Stay safe and have a great um, afternoon, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank and you. Bye -bye. Take bye -bye. care. Thanks. Bye. Bye.